Okay, it looks like it's time for us to get started. Hello everyone and welcome to this month's Northwest ATTC webinar. I'm Jennifer Verbeck and I'm your host for today. We're excited to have Dr. Anne-Marie Rupke presenting for us today on resilience and wellness. Couple of quick housekeeping things. First, if you have any questions for our presenter, please type them into the chat box at any time. And she will try to answer some of those as we go along. And we can also reserve some time at the end of the presentation to answer some of them. You'll also be getting a, an email at the end of today's webinar that has a link to a survey in it. Please take that survey. Helps us make sure we're bringing you the content you're interested in. That email will also have a link to download the slides from today and a link to our website where you'll be able to find a recording of the webinar and that should be available later this afternoon. Additionally, we'll be sending everyone who attends this live webinar a certificate of attendance and that takes us about a week to get those out. You don't need to do anything to get the certificate unless you're watching this in a group. Um, in that case, please have someone in the group email us within a business day with the names and email addresses for everyone who wants a certificate. And our email address is on there. It's northwest at attcnetwork.org. Okay, uh, now on to our webinar. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Anne-Marie Rupke, who is a clinical psychologist and a regular trainer for the Northwest ATTC. Dr. Rupke's areas of expertise include resilience, well-being, stress management, workplace communication, motivational, uh, interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapies, and the impact of trauma. And with that, I'll just turn it over to Dr. Rupke. All right. Thank you so much, Jennifer, uh, for the introduction. And thank you all for making the time to be here today. It feels like a very appropriate, relevant time for us to be exploring resilience because this year has presented us so many challenges that resilience is more relevant than ever. And this month, uh, perhaps resilience is more relevant than ever. We are here in the midst of what is a holiday season in various faith traditions. And you know, some songs and cultural messaging tell us that this is the most wonderful time of the year, right? And yet for so many people, this is going to be a very sad time of year, a very lonely and taxing time of year, a very scary time of year, maybe a very traumatic time of year. Um, and so while I certainly hope that you're able to find those wonderful moments, um, I think this is a prime opportunity for us to think about ways that we can face all of the challenges together. All right, so, oh, excuse me. All right, so, before we launch into resilience, um, my colleagues at UW and I wanted to take a moment for a land acknowledgement. I am joining you from Seattle, where the University of Washington is located. And we wanna take a moment to respectfully acknowledge this land is the traditional home of the Duwamish, Muckleshoot, Suquamish, and Tulalip tribal nations. And so I wanna take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here. And as we reflect on resilience, I think it presents us with an opportunity to think about both the adversity that different communities have faced historically and presently, as well as the tremendous resilience of different communities in facing, in responding to, in persevering through all of that adversity. Because resilience, as we will unpack in a little bit, is really not just an individual endeavor. Resilience is also a collective and a communal endeavor. So let me share with you what I have in mind for our time today as we unpack resilience. In a moment, I'll invite you to take part in a brief grounding exercise, if that sounds of interest to you. And then we'll dive in and explore what resilience means, what it means to you, what it means in the science of resilience. And then we'll briefly touch on a few concepts and strategies that we can turn to to boost our resilience in difficult times. So we'll talk about finding our true north in the storm, which is going to have to do with using our values to navigate through threat and anxiety and uncertainty. We'll talk about turning towards self-compassion as we do so. And we'll briefly wrap up by talking about ways to take care of ourselves. And as you see at the bottom of the screen here, this is meant for educational and informational purposes, not as therapy or specific mental health advice. So if any of this doesn't apply to you, you can absolutely skip it, throw it out, 
um, or check in with a mental health professional that you trust to figure out you know, how any of these strategies would fit for you. So three invitations for you in this time together. First, please, please, please do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself and make this webinar as comfortable and productive an experience as possible. It would be a cruel irony to be in a talk about resilience and wellness and be denying our most basic needs. So I'd invite you to take a moment to check in with yourself. Do you need food? Do you need water or caffeine? Do you need to put on some comfortable cozy clothes um, or do something else to make your body feel a little bit better and more comfortable right now? Second invitation to please jump in and share your thoughts and share your expertise. Um, I am not the only one here with expertise about resilience, right? You all have tremendous professional expertise as well as personal expertise in how to get through adversity. So I so wish that we were sitting here, you know, together with coffees and we could really share thoughts in an organic way. What it'll mostly look like today is sharing your thoughts in the chat box. I will prompt you at different times for your input, but please feel free to jump in anytime um, with questions or comments. We'll get to as many of them as we can. And finally, I would invite you to be intentional about if you want to take any action at all based on this discussion today. Um, sometimes self-care is about doing more or doing things differently, and you'll certainly have an opportunity at the end to make that decision. But sometimes taking care of ourselves is about doing less and accepting good enough coping, right? And so if all that you want this to be is an hour away from the usual duties and you want to take no action on anything that I suggest, that is totally fine. All right. So with that, um, I'll invite those who would like to to take part in a brief grounding exercise. Um, if you already know that this sort of thing is not for you, I trust you on that. You can absolutely um, hang tight, mute me if you would like, and rejoin us in a couple minutes when you see the next slide advance. Um, but if you'd like to take part in a grounding exercise, um, here's what we'll do. Um, so the background, the rationale for this has to do with tapping into the power of our nervous system. So the nervous system, like many things in our body, has sort of two complementary aspects. So just in the same way that our arm has a bicep that helps us do this motion, and then a tricep that helps us do the opposite, our nervous system has a couple parts. It has the part that amps us up and gets us ready to combat threats when we need to go into fight or flight mode. That's the sympathetic nervous system. And it has the part that soothes us, that calms us, that grounds us, that brings us back down again when those threats are over. That's the parasympathetic nervous system. So this is going to be a brief uh, sort of mindfulness-based sensory awareness exercise that can potentially just help us tap into the activity of that parasympathetic nervous system. So if you'd like to take part, I'd invite you to just start by uh, getting in as comfortable a position as you're able perhaps turning off your phone or any other distractions. If it serves you, you can close your eyes. If it doesn't serve you, perhaps you're too tired or perhaps closing your eyes brings in unpleasant thoughts or memories. You can just rest your eyes with a soft gaze, maybe looking at a blue spot on the screen. And just give yourself a moment here to settle in. And starting out, but perhaps just setting an intention to be mindful here, that is to pay attention to whatever's here in the present moment without judgment, just with an open, curious spirit. First, bringing that mindful awareness to any sounds that you can hear in your environment. Simply noticing each noise and the spaces in between them. And 
And if you're like most people, you may notice that from time to time, the mind wants to pay attention to something else. Totally normal, not a problem, just gently escorting your attention back to our focus at this moment, the sounds that you can hear. And now if it serves you bringing your attention to the body, noticing all the points of contact or connection where the body is resting on, supported by another surface. Perhaps feeling all the points of contact where the body is supported by a chair. Tracing that outline as if the chair were covered in paint and you could picture exactly where that paint would be on your clothes when you stood up. Perhaps noticing the feet grounded on the floor. And now, if it serves you, bringing your focus to the breath. If you prefer not to, you can absolutely linger on sounds or physical sensations. But if you're paying attention to the breath, perhaps just noticing the gentle movement in the body as you breathe in and out. Being curious to notice everything about it as if this were the first time that you were experiencing breath in a human body. Where is their movement? In the chest, in the belly, in the sides or back of the ribs. And there's nothing that you need to fix or do on purpose. You're really just watching the body breathe itself. Perhaps noticing the sensation of air entering and leaving the nostrils. Perhaps noticing how fast or how slow the breath is right now. Maybe counting as you breathe in, counting as you breathe out. And now if it serves you briefly bringing your mindful awareness to the mind itself and just checking in with yourself, what sorts of thoughts, what sorts of emotions might be bouncing around for you today. Just noticing those thoughts and emotions as if they were leaves floating by on a stream. Taking a final moment in silence here for yourself for whatever you need, whether that's setting an intention for the rest of your day, checking in with yourself about what you need, or just luxuriating and having a moment where you don't have to do anything. And as we get ready to close and move on together, perhaps wiggling fingers or toes, starting to move or stretch or reposition the body, noticing the sounds in your space again. And then as you're ready, coming back to us. And we'll move on. All right. So we're here to talk about resilience. And I'll certainly be sharing background from the science of resilience. But what I'm really interested in first is what is resilience to you? When you hear that term, 
resilience, what does it make you think of? I would love if people could share in the chat box. What is resilience to you personally? Capacity to overcome, surviving, bouncing back, not giving up, continuing to try again, coping, coping through hardship, maintaining perhaps your well being as you do so, adaptability to challenges, a huge theme that we'll talk about today with resilience and a huge theme that's been demanded of us this year for sure. And getting through the tough times. We don't tend to talk about resilience when things are good, right? Resilience makes the most sense in the context of struggle, adversity, trauma, threat, challenge. Now, certainly we can talk about resilience with change generally because change can be quite taxing. Um, but in particular, we're gonna be talking about adapting to adverse unwanted changes. I'm also seeing recognizing your strengths in the midst of that adversity, psychological flexibility. So here we're talking about some resilience assets, right? Those processes that help us to be resilient. Absolutely, thank you so much for sharing these. I think that you'll see a lot of these themes in the scientific definition that I'm about to share and that I really like. And I'm gonna unpack why I really love this particular definition of resilience. So Anne Mastin, who's pioneered a lot of this research, talks about resilience as a set of processes that enables good outcomes in spite of serious threats. And the number one reason I love this definition is this emphasis on resilience as a process or a set of processes. So we're talking about skills, responses, habits, coping methods, and so forth. We're not talking about a personality trait or a personality type. And previously in the science of resilience, that was a more popular way to talk about it. Um, this idea that there were resilient personality types and then there were the rest of us. And I guess you just had to hope that you had a resilient personality because otherwise, what are you gonna do? But what we know now from the sum of this science on resilience is that really it is much more dynamic and therefore to me much more hopeful than that because resilience is this set of processes, responses, skills, habits. And so that means that those things are changeable. It means they are learnable, they are improvable, and that we can all therefore do more to build up our capacity to survive, bounce back, persevere, continue through change, all these things that you all are speaking to. So those processes enable good outcomes. And those good outcomes can be very different from person to person. For some people, it might be preventing anxiety or depression or problematic substance use or any other mental or behavioral health challenges when going through adversity. For other people, it might be managing those problems, challenges, symptoms that are already there. So in the most recent survey data that I've seen, at this point, one in three people in our country is experiencing significant levels, clinically significant levels of anxiety, depression, or both. So managing that and being able to recover from that can absolutely be one of these good resilient outcomes. For others, the more relevant outcome might be maintaining well-being. So not so much coping with turning down the negatives, but keeping or turning up the positives that in spite of it all, we may be able to find some moments of meaning, of purpose, of deep engagement and fascination in what we're doing, chances to use our strengths or to find flow, moments of connection and love, moments of humor or fun in spite of it all. And for some, the good outcomes might really be about being effective, regardless of what we're feeling, focusing on what we're doing and are we fulfilling our roles and our commitments at work, at home, with the family, and so forth. And then all of this is happening, right, in spite of serious threats, as you all spoke to again in your definitions, resilience is about being able to function well or being able to persevere through these challenges. And we could literally spend the rest of this webinar time today just listing and un unpacking the different threats that we've been facing in 2020. So there is, of course, the global pandemic and 
all that comes with that, all the downstream effects, all of the traumas that that causes for people. There are many people that are living under the weight of racism in its many forms. And this is of course not something new in 2020, but something that we have been paying more attention to and having more dialogue about this year. There's a tremendous amount of what I am sometimes hearing being called civil unrest, which seems as good a term as any for where our nation is at. We are living of course through a recession right now. And I know that many of us on this call work in helping professions, mental health, behavioral health, healthcare. And so there are unique threats and risks that come with being a helper, uh, compassion fatigue, secondary traumatic stress, burnout, and so forth. And all of this is on top of the usual and ordinary traumas and stressors and threats of our personal lives as we just go through the human condition. So it is a lot. It is a lot and resilience is more important than ever. Now, uh, I don't think I could get through this hour without at least one rant. So I think this is going to be it. Um, because I think that this year we've been hearing a ton of messaging about self-care. And I admit I'm going to use that expression here today too. Um, but I think a lot of people are really getting fed up with being told, you need to do more self-care. How's your self-care? You need to treat yourself. You need to sleep more. You need to take it easy. Um, uh, you know, I, I heard one person in a meeting recently say, you know, if I hear about self-care one more time, I'm going to throw up. And I think it's a really valid reaction because I think that when we just tell an individual person, hey, you need to do more self-care, we're missing a couple important things. And I think the first thing we're missing is that as I alluded to before, resilience is not all on you as an individual. Resilience is a team sport. And to truly be resilient, we need more than just our own self-care efforts, although those are instrumental, but we need tons of support from our community, from our workplace, from our society. Someone would be absolutely justified in saying, I don't need more self-care, I need childcare. I need adequate protective personal equipment at my job. I need better working conditions and opportunities so that I don't have to put myself at risk in a way that I don't want to because I can't live without this income. So I think that it's crucial to keep in mind that resilience is a team sport. And if you are not feeling so resilient, it is not because of a character deficit in you or a personal feeling. I think the second thing that's missing from this, oh, good, just go do more self-care, treat yourself, is that we really need coping flexibility. You know, so often, um, I think that when we see, for instance, magazine articles about self-care, particularly prior to this year, um, we see sort of this poster child of self-care, which is like a beautiful young white woman with a spa mask on and cucumbers over the eyes and a towel over the head. Um, and we have this narrow vision of self-care as self-indulgence, taking a spa day and so forth. And again, what we really know from the emerging science on coping is that the name of the game is coping flexibility, adaptability, diversity of methods. We all need a toolbox that is full to overflowing with different tools that we can bring out for different types of adversity, different days, different situations. And so, yeah, it's absolutely great and important to have sort of self-indulgent treats and so forth, but we really need a ton of different tools that we can flexibly draw upon. So my hope is that perhaps there will be something here in this webinar today that either reminds you of a tool that you have and you haven't used in a while, or perhaps that introduces a new tool for you or for the people that you serve. So the first concept and tool that I wanted to talk about is one that I think has been really important to me in coping with this year and has been really important and useful to a lot of people, perhaps to some of you as well this idea of finding our true north in the storm. Now the storm that we're talking about in this metaphor is anxiety and threat. For example, all those threats that we were listing earlier. So when we are surrounded by threats, when we face a threat, the most natural response of the brain and the body is anxiety. That is just our system trying to protect us from threat. And you're probably familiar with the fight, flight, or freeze response that typically happens when our brain and our body are under threat and trying to protect us. And that works really well for some threats, right? So if we imagine 
um, being stalked by a, a, a wildcat, right? A saber-toothed tiger or whatever it might be. Um, yeah, we probably need to either fight it, run away really fast, or if all else fails, freeze, play dead, hope that we can hide and not be seen. So with some sorts of concrete and acute threats, the fight or flight or freeze system functions pretty well. But there are other threats, right, where this doesn't really work optimally. I think that COVID is a really good example of that. It's not so obvious how we could literally physically fight it. It's not so obvious how we could run away from it, particularly without making huge sacrifices. And it's not so clear that freezing helps us. And I think there are many stressors and threats in modern life that are like this, right? If we think about having a, a toxic work environment or a toxic boss, well, you probably can't get in a fist fight, flee or freeze. And so there might just be this ongoing sense of threat. And so it brings up this question of, well, what do we do with chronic, lingering anxiety, stress, unease, fear, and so forth? And if you're like most of us, when we're feeling things that are deeply unpleasant, our most natural response is to say, I don't want to feel this. I want to get rid of this feeling. I want to push it aside. I want to push it down. Totally understandable. And totally inconvenient because you might find that that strategy, it doesn't work that well for that long, right? When we try to push down our emotions, I think of this like trying to push down a beach ball that you might see your kids play with at the swimming pool or at the ocean. Maybe you can grab that beach ball, you can shove it under the surface of the water, but it does not sink to the bottom of the ocean and bury itself never to be seen again, right? It's still there under the surface waiting to pop up and maybe hit us in the face at an inopportune moment and in the meantime, we have to put in that work of holding it down and we can't use our hands for other things. And so in the same way, when we have to put in so much effort to holding down our emotions, it doesn't tend to be necessarily optimal or sustainable. So what do we do? What do we do if we can't run from the threats? We can't fight the threats. We can't indefinitely just push down or away our emotions. Well, there are, of course, tons of tools that mental health providers use with the clients that we serve to respond to chronic stress, anxiety, strain. But the one that I wanna to speak to you right now is this idea of the anxiety dial and the values dial. So this is influenced by acceptance and commitment therapy, by motivational interviewing. And the idea is this, the good news is that there are many, many factors that influence our well-being, that influence our resilience. It's not just the level of threat or anxiety, but there's really a whole control panel of factors that influence our wellness. And so we may find that there are times that that anxiety dial is cranked up to high. And try as we might, we're not quite able to get it unstuck and turn it down. So in that situation, we can look at the rest of our control panel and say, well, what other dials can I mess with here? What other ways can I influence my wellness? And I think a crucial dial for that is this values dial. So to what extent am I really tuned into what matters most to me? And to what extent am I lining up my day-to-day -day behavior and my day-to-day -day life with those top meaningful values and priorities? So we can think of values as the true north on our compass, that no matter what sort of stormy sea we're navigating through, no matter how much fog um, is obscuring the view, we can go back to that true north on the compass to figure out how to navigate through. And so we are navigating according to our values and not just navigating according to our anxiety. And I think that we've seen so many rich examples of this this year, right? We see this in our medical professionals who make these value-based decisions to potentially put themselves in harm's way to take care of our community during COVID. We see this in people who are fighting for racial justice, sometimes at great sacrifice or threat to themselves, but because it is a deep value. A fair amount of the psychotherapy that I do with people is focused around anxiety, fear, trauma, and so forth. And I'm continually inspired by the way that people continue to choose their values over their fears. And I'm continually reminded 
uh, this great quote um, by a fellow named Ambrose Redmond, who says something like, courage is the decision that something else is more important than fear. That something else is more important than fear. And you can probably look at examples in your own life of times that you've decided that your values are more important than your fears. What I'm talking about here by values is just simply what you care most about. What is really meaningful to you? It's a little bit different than goals, right? Goals might be something really concrete that we can put on a list and check off a list. And isn't that immensely satisfying when we see that goal is done? Values, they're not something that we're ever really done with, right? They are the why underneath our goals, the reason that those goals even matter to us to begin with. So if values are true north on the compass, goals are like the landmarks that we pass along the way. So what I wanna invite you to do right now is to just do a little bit of reflection about how this applies to you, this idea of navigating by our values and not just navigating by our anxieties. So of course, the first step in that is getting crystal clear about what our values are, both in general and in our changing circumstances. And then figuring out how do we put those into action given the context that we're in right now. So what I'm gonna invite you to do in a moment is to take a look at this list of values. And this is probably 2% of the values we could care about. Um, all the different things that could be meaningful to us could not fit on the screen. So don't limit yourself to this, but perhaps this can be a jumping off point to spur some ideas in your mind. So I would invite you to look at this list and or to grab a piece of scrap paper and write the sentence, what I really care about is, and see what comes up for you. So go ahead and just take about a minute to yourself to do a little bit of reflection on your top values and perhaps how they're showing up in your life lately as you respond to challenges. And if you would be willing to share in the chat box, I would love if people would share what some of their top values are right now. I'm really appreciating reading these responses and I imagine your colleagues are too. Thank you for sharing these. If you wanna to share too how you're using any of these values to navigate through this tough year, that would also be most welcome. Sharing the thing you care about and how it's showing up or helping you. It seems like in this group, there's a lot of orientation toward caring for others, fighting for others, connecting with others. And I'm not surprised to know that within our profession, so many of our colleagues here 
do you really care about other people? Um, a gentleman named Christopher Peterson was one of the founding fathers of positive psychology. And when he was interviewed and asked to sum up everything about the field of positive psychology in three words, you know, what have we learned about the factors that create and maintain human flourishing? His three word summary was other people matter. And I feel like that's reflected in your responses here. So thank you for sharing these. Um, my next question for you about values is what was it like to try to name your top few values? What came up? What thoughts, what questions? I'd love to see those in the chat box. Was it hard? Was it easy? Was it obvious? Was it subtle? For some perhaps obvious. Yeah, sometimes it can be difficult narrowing it down to the top three and someone else is alluding to this question of what's important to me right now, which might be different, different than what's important to me generally or broadly. I think part of what's happened for some people is um, values and priorities have been rearranged as they have to respond to the current circumstances. I wonder if anyone had the experience that other training participants have shared with me that part of what made it tough to pick the top values is that some of them might bump into each other or conflict with each other. I think that can be a painful process. It's sort of like the more profound version, right? Of if I put on an outfit and I ask my friend, hey, do I look good in this? And they have to choose between being honest or being kind because it's hard to do both at the same time. I think so often we get into a deeper version of that, right? Where there are different things that we really care very deeply about, but we cannot max them out at the same time because there are trade-offs, whether that is simply trade-offs of our time and our energy and our emotional labor, or whether it's because they really do directly uh, compromise each other. Um, and I think that that can be part of what makes um, a time like this very painful is that we know that we have to let go of certain things that are normally very important to us. So I think that that brings us into our next topic, our next approach or tool for cultivating resilience during tough times. And that is the idea of turning toward self-compassion. It has been a tough year. And even if we are doing our level best to continue living out our values, we know that we will inevitably fall short of perfection with that, right? Because we are limited beings, uh, we have limited resources, and there are sometimes these trade-offs to be made. And I think that right now, a lot of people are just really feeling the strain, people are feeling drained, people are feeling exhausted from just the emotional reserves being depleted, right? We've gone through different phases of our response to this collective trauma that is the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, there are some great um, graphs that I could send out with materials if you would like that kind of chart the typical course of emotional highs and lows during a, a collective disaster. And it will not surprise you to hear that on most of those, around this point is really an emotional low in that process. Now, earlier on, the collective energy was a little bit different. Some of you might remember some of the memes that were going, going around on the internet really early in COVID-19. Um, one of my favorite ones early on said something like this. Day one of quarantine, I'm gonna really use this time at home as an opportunity to focus on my health. Day three of quarantine, I am eating lasagna in my shower. And I think this is a lot of people's experience, right? That early on there might've been high hopes, good intentions, lots of motivation to really, um, you know, cope productively or use this time productively. And yet, as one respondent to this meme said, um, you know, maybe a collective trauma isn't the best time for us to set a ton of new productive goals. Um, another meme that was going around early on is this uh, well-intended reminder that Shakespeare wrote King Lear when he was quarantined during a plague. Um, I also subsequently heard that Sir Isaac Newton invented calculus while quarantined. Um, 
Now, if that's motivating and inspiring to you, amazing. Again, the theme is that different people need different things at different times. Um, so if that's motivating, wonderful. But I think for many people, it can create a sense of pressure or it can create a sense of failure that not only do we have to survive through a trying time, but we have to thrive more than ever before. We have to revolutionize English literature and so forth. And so self-compassion becomes crucial. Um, Self-judgment becomes very tempting, right? Very commonplace. I know I have um, seen a ton and heard a ton of very harsh self-criticism as people respond to the challenges of 2020. And I would be curious for you to share what are some ways that you have seen that self-judgment, either in yourself or in other people? What are some of the things that we've been hard on ourselves about, criticizing ourselves about, feeling like failures about, and so forth? These may start with the phrase, I should, or I shouldn't, or I should have. Um, please do share in the chat box what you've noticed in self or others. Yeah, I should exercise more. If we were play, playing Family Feud, that's probably ding, 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 the most common response that I hear from people. I should wear real clothes while working. That's a good one. Um, parenting. We have set up working parents to feel like they're failing in both work and parenting, right? It's a really tough situation. I should attend church. Um, I should have cleaned the closet. I should eat healthier. I should be more productive. I should decorate for Christmas. I should keep up with the gardening and home remodeling projects of everyone I see on social media. I shouldn't have gained weight. I should be more grateful. I should be handling the stress better. I think that one can be very tempting, particularly for those of us who are mental health or behavioral health providers to think I should be coping better. I'm supposed to be an expert in this. Yeah, I should be more productive. I'm saving this commute time. I should be getting everything done. I should be starting my side hustle right now. Mm -hmm. I should be grateful. I shouldn't feel this bad. And I've heard the contrary. I should feel worse. I feel numbed to it. I'm a horrible person for not being more upset. And I imagine that every single one of these um, that, that you all posted, someone can relate to here. So let's you know, take a cue from our participant here, Star, about perhaps working to delete the words shoulda, coulda, woulda from our vocabulary. So I think that sometimes this self-criticism comes from a really good place, right? Because we want to be accountable. We want to hold ourselves to a high standard. We want to live out our values and have integrity, and that's great. Um, but when that turns into really harsh self-judgment, we can ask ourselves, is that helping us or is it actually hurting us? And the way that I think about this is that as we go through our lives as human beings, there are some experiences that are unavoidably painful. Hmm. They just have a core of pain at the center of that experience. And there is no resilience skill, right? There is no technique that I could give you that would delete the pain of certain experiences that we go through. And sometimes in some situations, we find that there are these additional layers of suffering that sort of congeal around that core of unavoidable pain. And sometimes that additional suffering is related to the way that we are judging ourselves, judging the situation, the way that we're thinking about framing it, talking to ourselves about it and so forth. And so when we are suffering, we might step back and ask ourselves, is self-judgment adding on any layers? And if so, could I turn toward self-compassion to melt some of those layers of suffering away? Now, when I speak about self-compassion, um, I want to differentiate it from self-esteem which can seem similar on the surface, but is quite different in some profound ways. So self-esteem is a positive evaluation of our worth. To me, the poster child for self-esteem is the old Saturday Night Live character, Stuart Smalley, from like 
20, 25 years ago on that show, you might remember he was this self-help type and he would look in the mirror and he had this catchphrase and it was I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, I'm doggone it, people like me. So when we're talking about self-esteem, we're talking about that, evaluating ourselves in a positive way. I'm smart, I'm likable, I'm good, and so forth. Great. There's a lot of literature about the benefits of self-esteem. I am not here to um, knock that down. I am here to talk about something that's slightly different, which is self-compassion, which is not about evaluating ourselves to see if we're worthy or not. It's about three other things. Perhaps first and foremost, treating ourselves with the kindness, the respect, the care and compassion that we treat our loved ones, that we treat our friends with. So often we talk to ourselves in very harsh ways that we would never let someone get away with speaking to someone that we love. Second, self-compassion is about recognizing our shared humanity. So when we feel that we're failing, when we feel that we're struggling, do we, do we shut ourselves off and say, oh, I'm the worst, I always mess everything up because I'm terrible and close ourselves off from connection? Or do we open ourselves up to connection by saying, well, this sure is the human experience. I am not the only one feeling this way. And then third, being mindful with judgments. So we may never turn off that harsh inner critic voice. Um, it may not be helpful to ever turn it completely off. And I don't know any ways to turn it completely off. If you do, please tell us. But what we can do is when we have that very critical voice, we can perhaps hold that criticism at arm's length and look at it and see if it's true or not, if it's helpful to us or not, as opposed to immediately buying into it. So my question for you is, what does self-compassion sound like? So for instance, what would you say to a loved one who is going through the types of challenges, the types of pain, that you've been dealing with in your own life? What would a compassionate or a self-compassionate thing sound like? For instance, maybe saying, you know, this is a hard, hard time and you are doing your best and that's just gonna have to be good enough and this won't be forever or whatever it might be. Let's, let's hear from you in your own words. What does it sound like to be self-compassionate? What would you say to a loved one facing the things you're facing? While you're typing, I'll share some that have come up in previous trainings. One that I really liked that someone shared was, you are enough. You are so enough. You are so unbelievably enough. I hear you. You are valid. I'm here for you. It's okay to not do it perfectly. You're a human. You will get through this. I've gone through something similar. You're not alone. Would you like for me to share what it was that helped me? And I love that, that respectful asking of permission. You got this. I care, I love you. I'm okay. You're strong, you can get through this. I so appreciate you all sharing these because you know what? There may be someone in this call right now of 117 people who needs to hear exactly the message that you're sharing right now. So thank you for these. Um. I wanted to share a tip for self-compassion in 30 seconds. Um, and this comes from Harvard Business Review, right? Of course, in the business world, we need to translate this to something that is highly efficient. Um, but there was a really thoughtful piece that came out um, about two, three weeks ago now called How Self-Compassion Will Make You a Better Leader. I've cited it here at the bottom if you wanna check it out. It was a great piece. And they had a really simple suggestion. There are, of course, many practices for self-compassion. But this one is really elegant in its simplicity and brevity. The idea is that we, when we're having a moment of suffering, we slow down and we take three breath, three breaths. With the first breath, we just ask ourselves, okay, what am I feeling? And put a name to it. And there's some really interesting science that has come out about how when we literally put a verbal label to an emotion, it helps to bring back online our prefrontal cortex these sort of 
thinking, planning, rational, logical part of our brain helps to kind of sync that back up with the more emotional limbic system. So simply naming the emotions can be powerful. Second breath, connecting with that shared humanity. Okay, not the only one feeling that way. And the third breath, one of these messages of support and kindness, like the beautiful ones that you have put in this chat box. Um, remember how much you've grown. You're so strong and kind. You're wildly capable or whatever it may be for you. Um, another practice that you might check out um, is called RAIN, R-A-I-N, by Tara Brock. that has a, a similar sort of structure. I'll make one final comment about self-compassion before we move toward our wrap up, which is just to say that I recognize that it is easier said than done. I find it easier to say than to do. And that's the reason that I call that unit turning toward self-compassion and not constantly embodying perfect self-compassion because I think it's a process that we turn to time and time again. It's an intention that we set time and time again. Um, I used to be involved with dance in the past when I was younger. And the thing that they teach you in dance is if you're gonna go execute some complicated series of spins across the floor, the first thing that you have to do is look in the direction that you're trying to go. And that is the only way that you have any hope of getting there um, without getting dizzy and nauseous and, and falling over yourself. And so I think of self-compassion like that. It is a constant process of turning in the direction of self-compassion and at least looking that way in order to give ourselves a fighting chance of eventually moving that way. All right, so in closing, let's talk about some really practical steps that we could use to take care of ourselves as we go through the rest of this tough year and this potentially complicated season. Now, I firmly believe that you don't need me to come here and lecture you that you should sleep and you should eat vegetables. I trust that you have a lot of insight and expertise about things that are good and helpful for you. So my question for you for the chat box is, what are some things that you know are good for you personally? Some things that you know really do make an impact on your mood, your wellness, your resilience. Another way to think of this is if you were asked to give a guest lecture in a high school life skills class, and you were asked to give teenagers advice about things they should do that would be good for their mental health and their well-being. What are some things you would list? Speaking to your higher power, being outside, faith, fresh air, smiling, running, yoga, having alone time, having downtime, laughter, exercise, sleep, rest, meditate, mindfulness. Absolutely. Absolutely. All core things. Less screen time. Sometimes it's about eliminating things as opposed to adding things. So thank you for all of these. You will see many of these reflected on this screen, right? Um, there are many common practices that we know can help to sustain us. And of course, the relative weight, the relative importance of these is different for different people. So I would invite you to consider what are your self-care strengths right now? What is it that you can own that you have really persisted with? Something that you are doing for yourself that is working for you, that's important to you? What can you take credit for? What are your self-care strengths, things that you want to continue? Walking. Playing the piano, having a creative outlet, going to bed on time, eating healthy and exercising. Yeah, and more abstract ones like being aware of our faults and willing to listen. Absolutely not only good for us, but for those relationships and for our communities. So thank you for that reflection. The next and the final question that I have for you is about what is one of these areas that you care about and you wanna improve? Maybe it's an area that you see on this screen right now or a reminder that you saw in the chat box of something that is part of someone else's self-care routine. And I would invite you to think about 
one concrete specific thing that you could choose to do more of, less of, differently this week? What is one thing that you could do for your own wellness, resilience, self-care this week? And yes, please do share that in the chat box if you're willing. One thing that we know from the science of motivation and goal attainment is that when we make that public commitment, it really boosts our success. So what an opportunity that we have here today. Thank you for these responses. And as you continue, um, I will just close by saying thank you. Um, thank you to Jennifer and Meg and the whole team at the Northwest ATTC for inviting me to spend this time with you. And thank you all for carving out this time in what I'm sure is a busy and demanding schedule. And much more than that, thank you for the work that you do. I don't know you personally, I don't know your job, but I know that the people who come to this webinar series tend to be helpers tend to be in helping roles, doing your part to support, to heal our communities. So I don't know how often you hear thank you in your role, but I'm almost certain that it is not often enough because that work is exactly what is needed in normal times and in these extraordinary times that we're going through right now. So thank you so much. Um, there are some resources here if you are feeling inspired to dig in more. Um, I love the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley for both articles, but also things like guided meditation audio tracks. Um, the, North, uh, the National Museum of African American History and Culture has put together a self-care toolkit that is specifically tailored for people of color. And um, there's a therapist directory here and my contact information. Please feel free to reach out. Um, I also bizarrely now have a podcast um, earlier in the pandemic when everyone was trying to contribute in their own ways to our collective resilience, I thought something I could do was share some of the things that we know from psychology and behavioral health. Um, so you can find that wherever you listen to podcasts, if that is your thing. Um, thank you so much. And with that, we have a few minutes if there are any questions that I missed before. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Annie. We really appreciate your time with us today and um, some great takeaways. Um, I think we did miss one question um, early on. It was, is resilience and tolerance the same thing? Or how are they mm. different? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I absolutely defer to the individual if they mean the same thing for you and if that's a helpful connection. The way that I would put it into that framework, into Ann Maston's definition of resilience, is that perhaps tolerance is one of those processes that we're talking about that promotes resilience, one of those processes that supports good outcomes in spite of serious threats. So just that ability to have the sort of willpower to withstand and to continue confronting and be, being present to things that we might want to escape from, I think that that can in the right situation absolutely be a resilience resource. That said, I also believe in um, the power of positive quitting, right? And there are times that avoidance, there are times that disengagement or that deciding I'm not going to tolerate something, I need to change my circumstances or I need to set a boundary. That can also absolutely be a process that supports resilience. Yeah, thank you for that question. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna do a couple of uh, closing things here. Um, please remember to take our survey for today. Um, you'll see that link in the chat box, but you'll also be getting an email um, with that link. So just make sure that you take that for us. We'll also be um, offering a webinar on January 27th, and that's titled Improving Outcomes by Recognizing and Responding to Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorders in Individuals in Treatment. Um, and we'll have some information about that webinar on our website. And then we'll also have these PowerPoints from today posted on our website. So um, thank you everyone. We really appreciate your time today and uh, we'll, we'll see you next month. Thank you, Annie. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me.
Thank you all for being here and for your work. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Be well.